In this, in this session, we'll cover the concept of Bayesian evidential learning. There's some reading uh, associated with that. Uh, there's chapter three on data science for UQ, uh, some sessions um, that are useful in terms of statistical methods. And then of course, there are chapter five on Bayesianism. To understand Bayesian and eventual learning, which is a, it's not a method, but a strategy of solving a decision-making on a certain problem, uh, it, it would be good to uh, analyze a little bit what this problem is and formulate some notation. So we saw that decision-making under certainty would rely on some key decision variables. So these variables are uncertain and will somehow be uh, revealed in the future. So we have to make predictions. So in most of what will follow us later, uh, we'll call predictions H. So predictions can only be made uh, based on models because uh, evidently the future is unknown so we have to build a model for the future and that's our model m of course models alone are not going to be very accurate uh, and so we have to uh, use data which is essentially what has been measured so that's the past uh, to constrain those models and there hopefully constrain those predictions so this data model world is something um, that uh, is well known. It's also data. It's also called inversion or model calibration. There are various uh, names for that: history matching, uh, data calibration, data assimilation, etc. We have to, however, take into account that the fact that uh, we're not really after the model uncertainty. We're after the prediction uncertainty, and that may actually that sort of way of thinking may actually help us in simplifying the problem. For example, uh, the instead of the classical approach, we can take other approaches, uh, which we'll call direct forecasting or data prediction modeling. So in, in, instead of doing this, first is data model calibration, we'll be using Monte Carlo uh, to generate uh, data variables and prediction variables and possibly build uh, statistical relationships between the two. So there, what I'm seeing here is that there are many choices within this diagram of proceeding. We don't have to necessarily stick with one particular choice. So Bayes' rule uh, is very well known, uh, and I'd like to frame Bayes' rule here more in a scientific uh, framework. Namely, in science, we formulate hypotheses, and we gather evidence in order to uh, assess these hypotheses, whether they're true or false. Uh, but in Bayesian uh, thinking, we go essentially a bit further, and we say, instead of saying they're true and false, we associate with them a certain probability. And so this probability, uh, which is called the posterior probability, base essentially says that it consists, it, it depends on two things. It depends on what we already know about hypothesis. It could be um, either nothing. Uh, and so each hypothesis could be taken, say, equally probable. Or we may have already information about a certain hypothesis, uh, and one may already be deemed to be more probable than another. And then there's a second component, which is the likelihood of evidence under the hypothesis to say, if we say the hypothesis is true, what is then the likelihood of the evidence that we have uh, gathered? So it's very important to understand how this base rule uh, that there are two components to uncertainty quantification. There is a prior distribution and there's a likelihood distribution. And what we'll see later on is that this prior distribution is actually quite important and often neglected in many uncertainty quantification studies. In the previous slide, we saw a simple uh, elementary rule, but that's basically for scalar variables. So when you go to real complex problems, uh, of course, we don't have scalar variables. We are, our variables are much high dimensional effects. They could be millions and, and billions of dimension. So in order to deal in a most general fashion with uh, uncertainty quantification within uh, these kind of Bayesian context, uh, we'll have at some point uh, to do Monte Carlo, in particular cases, uh, as I said, with uh, with these high dimensional variables. There are ways uh, of not doing Monte Carlo, um, but those again, they only apply to limited situations. So here we, we take the approach of just doing Monte Carlo, um, which I think is the most general fashion in a way forward in designing any uncertainty quantification study. So central to this Monte Carlo uh, is always the model world. So the model, the way we should see that is essentially there is the model uh, parameterization. That is, how are we going to represent the Earth? Uh, what do we think the true Earth uh, looks like and how would we numerically present it uh, on a computer system? So that's something that has to come first. Uh, then second, we have to think about the prior distribution. And that's uh, something that's very important, but also something uh, 
uh, that is uh, requires some uh, testing as we see uh, later on. So in stating this prior distribution, we typically state uh, reasonable ranges of parameters we believe uh, there to exist based on um, experience we have, or even possibly using some uh, observations already to, to sort of limit um, the ranges that we are uh, expecting. The idea here is initially not to be super accurate or worry about whether this is correct or not correct. You see later in the course that we'll go to uh, a process what's called falsification, where we'll try to uh, reject uh, this kind of uh, hypothesis that we're making in terms of the prior distribution. So if we generate Monte Carlo, then if we run Monte Carlo, we can generate many model realizations or many model samples. So what about now there's data, remember our triangle, there's data and there's prediction. The relationship with data is essentially an action we take, right? It's a measurement we take, it's something we drill, we do a geophysical survey. It's a human action that is being applied to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the Earth, the model world, uh, so to speak. And so therefore this action is a function. That means if we would know the true Earth, then we would know exactly what observation uh, we would get in case we would know with, our, with no measurement error. And so there's this forward function, which is the data forward model that generates us uh, realizations of D if I had realizations of M. So this we call the data variables uh, that should be uh, distinguished from what we call the actual observations. This is what we measure in the field. And so when we want to measure in the field, we don't have uh, necessarily perfect access to this GD and there may be uh, errors and these are the measurement errors. So that's the, the data variables, and you may have many different types of data, and that gives you different types of these forward functions. So from the model world, we can also uh, predict, if we had a, the true Earth, we can also predict the, uh, the true future, and that because we don't have the true Earth, we have only realizations of it, uh, we can also get realizations of the future. So all these are prior distributions. This is the prior distribution or experimental representation of the prior distribution of D, of M, and of H. So it's very important in an uncertainty quantification uh, study and design that we start from this uh, definition. So we have to define M, F of M, G of D, G of H, and D ops. Uh, if you're going to do it differently and say, well, I could already constrain variables with D, then uh, you run into problems later on that your uncertainty quantification is unrealistic, and usually it's too narrow. So as I mentioned uh, before, Bayesian evidential learning is not a method, but it's a way of thinking about uncertainty that then eventually leads to choosing the appropriate method for a given decision and prediction problem. The point here is that in terms of uncertainty quantification, there's no unique single method that's going to work for you in all cases. So what's very important is to design uh, a method that is particular to your case, but also, um, of course, we would like to more rely on a strategy that's more prescriptive uh, instead of uh, focusing on in single methods. So why do we call it Bayesian evidential and learning? Uh, first of all, it's Bayesian, and that's what we'll cover in this uh, presentation. Of course, it uses data, so we'll have to use data to uh, reduce uncertainty on model parameters and then therefore predictions. And also, and I guess this is the, the somewhat unique feature of it, is that it lies on form of statistical learning. So uh, it particularly relies on Monte Carlo and building a relationship between the various variables that are there. And there, as I mentioned, there are three variables, which are data variables, model variables, and prediction variables. And so there's forms of statistical learning that will be applied to this Monte Carlo results uh, that lead to a fast uh, quantification of uncertainty. So quantifying uncertainty is more, uh, it's more of a difficult and fundamental problem than you think, obviously. There's no necessarily unique definition of uncertainty. We shouldn't necessarily equate uncertainty with probability. Uh, there are many forms uh, of uh, uncertainty uh, quantification. There are many forms of formulating that. So we could say as a broad definition that uncertainty is about lack of, un of knowledge. And so then we run into the, again, the question is, well, how do you define knowledge? Uh, and so that's in the field of, of epistemology, uh, which itself is a, a quite a, a broad field. We'll talk a lot about the rationality in quantifying uncertainty, and we'll see examples where human behave irrationally in the face of evidence and uncertainty, and that, that kind of behavior we have to be very aware of. Um, so we have to then, we'll definitely rely on the axioms of probability to, de to, to define uncertainty, uh, but again, in the book, there are alternatives that are being formulated. So you may have heard this term Bayesian uh, many times, and it's more 
as I mentioned before, it's more of a way of thinking uh, than just Bayes' rule. Uh, in particular, what we'll see is that Bayes' contribution was not so much Bayes' rule. In fact, he did not write Bayes' rule. Uh, that came later, um, but what his contribution was mostly was in the prior uh, uncertainty uh, definition. Okay, so what I'll provide now is a short uh, history of uh, the philosophy of science, that basically how did people approach science in history, uh, and that has evolved, it's always been the same, uh, and pr pretty much what we're doing now, most people do prescribe to Bayesianism, as a philosophy, even if they really don't uh, know exactly that that's what they're doing. So the science uh, in, initially was very em empirical. Um, I'm reading a book currently about Da Vinci, and he would be a great example of empiricism. That means just basically by doing experimentation, uh, trying to discover uh, theories and models for things. So if you apply that in the UQ realm, we could say, well, data is first and models are second. Uh, so data is more objective than models and UQ is more subjective. So that is basically uh, the idea of empiricism is that uh, theories and models are derived from facts. And so facts are these, conc these concrete observations that you can't refute. That's necessarily uh, correct. Um, so what I'd like you to do is look at this uh, panel here would look, look like a door and um, and look at this uh, for a while and say, well, it looks like a panel. And then it would ask you a question uh, that, and how many circles are in this panel? And so your observations would say there are no circles in this panel. The fact is that there are no circles in this panel. Uh, but then I'd like you to look a bit more careful and focus, for example, uh, on this area here. This area here. So we see here. If you flip your eyes a little bit, you see one, two, three, et cetera. We've seen 16 circles. So your fact is not another person's fact. Uh, there is basically um, uh, the human intervention that comes with uh, turning uh, reality into what are called observations. So the observations are not without the observer. Here's another experiment. Uh, let's say what you look at when you look at this, what would you think this is? So if you'd like to think about that for a little bit, you can pause the, the video. So when I ask this question, I get many answers. People say, um, well, it's a, it's a stratigraphy, it's a, it's a layers, or somebody uh, may say it's a geophysical survey with reflectors. Um, someone may say, oh, I can see uh, pinch outs, uh, et cetera. So again, the observation is not without the observers because this is essentially a photo I took uh, from the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, uh, where painters have drawn some what look like random lines, and they turn out to be, uh, if you zoom in into one particular area, it looks like a geological formation. Another really cool example is the size of the moon. Uh, so sometimes uh, we hear in the news that, oh, the moon is going to be very big tonight. Uh, in at the horizon, uh, it's called the harvest moon or the blue moon. Uh, well, blue moon is, is not that, it's the harvest moon or, or other types of moon uh, during the year. What turns out is that this is absolutely not true. Uh, if you would take an optical device, not your eye, uh, you will find that the moon is equal size, uh, optically at least, uh, whether it's at the horizon or uh, above you. And so, again, the eye um, is deceiving you in the sense that, and it's not necessarily clear that there is any logical explanation why the eye is doing that. But some people say that if you look at the moon relative to the environment, uh, when it's on the horizon, uh, the eye is somewhat adjusts size. Uh, so again, we see here uh, something that's not necessarily real. So even if you would say this is a geophysical survey, and you would ask a number of people, what are we looking at? You will like, again, get many different answers. Um, so here, this is essentially uh, a, a gas reservoir. So you get that uh, this very bright spot uh, that's indicating of a gas reservoir. There's a study being done by uh, Bond et al. Um, they sent, essentially, they created a synthetic seismic uh, survey where they knew, of course, the answer of what it is that they were looking at and uh, send it out to many interpreters. Uh, 
Uh, another surprising results, perhaps, is that uh, interpreters were had showed a significant cognitive bias. So, for example, somebody who works on uh, salt domes would recognize salt domes, uh, etc. And what's even more surprising is that people, gave, even though only 25% or so gave a correct answer, uh, many people said they had very high confidence in their answer. So this high confidence uh, and this um, cognitive biases uh, is something that we'll uh, revisit at the end of this presentation. So I think this previous example show uh, really nicely that um, model and data really go hand in hand. They are not separate. Uh, that data comes with its own model, and that uh, humans are often uh, not good observe, uh, not good of representation, but not necessarily give a good representation of actual reality. So the experiment is not without the experimenters. Okay, Bayesianism, uh, which we'll cover later, is, is partly based on inductive logic, uh, but not necessarily fully. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about induction as a may, as a way of scientific. Uh, reasoning. So induction is essentially how to derive theories from observations. So in our case, it's how to derive models from, from data. Uh, so induction is uh, easy to explain. Uh, for example, here with these two propositions that says all systems uh, contain classic sands. The subsurface system under study is deltaic. Therefore, as conclusion, uh, as an induction, the subsurface system contains classic sands. So that's nice, but you can also see that induction does not question the propositions itself. So you can also give the second example where I say all the deltaic system contains steel, the subsurface system under study is deltaic, and the subsurface system contains steel. So this is perfectly logical. However, of course, the first statement or proposition is incorrect. So <clears throat> induction essentially relies on observations and replications of observations. Uh, such that the more observation, the stronger uh, our conclusion can become. And so we say, I observe, I, I get many uh, cores out of the subsurface, I, I make observations, and each observation sort of confirms what, what I already have seen in previous observations. So my conclusion is, uh, in this case, it would be the reservoir is water wet and not oil wet. So there is a famous uh, philosopher and scientist, uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, who provided the same argument about, he's called the turkey argument. Um, I think in his case, it was not a turkey, a chicken. But the point here is that um, the turkey observes that um, he, she get fed at 9 a.m. every day of the year. And so uh, December 24 would come around December 25 and the turkey would still make the same conclusion that I will be fed at 9 a.m. Another really nice example is this one here. Um, I'm just going to read that for you. Uh, but in all my experience, I have never been in an, any accident of any sort worth speaking of about. Uh, I have seen but one vessel in distress in all my years at sea. I never saw a wreck and never have been wrecked, nor was I ever in any predicament that threatened to end the disaster of any sort. So this is a very inductive type of reasoning. And this was a statement made by the captain of the Titanic. So that doesn't mean that, uh, well, let's, let's first cover this. Uh, most uh, uncertainty quantification today is very inductionist, uh, and it has to do a lot with uh, the idea of in doing inversion right from the get-go. Uh, so we get data, we build a model that matches our data, the model is derived from the data. So the model that matches data is a representation of truth. So this also means that inductionists seek somehow a deterministic truth in other sense that the more data they can acquire, the less uncertain they become about their model. Uh, and so at some point they hope to resolve all of this with as long as enough data is required. The problem, however, is that the model that we have is a highly uh, simplified representation of reality. So to say that the model that matches data is a representation of truth is essentially a bit of a stretch of the imagination. And particularly in the subsurface, if you think about all the variables that are involved, data variables, model variables, etc., it's the prediction variables, it's the model variable that is the most simplified representation of actual reality. So to focus immediately on that model and matching it with data uh, often can lead to uh, serious consequences in uncertainty quantification. 
So David Hume, uh, another philosopher, uh, stated that very nicely um, in history, is that any model or theory derived from observation can never ever be uh, proven as in the sense of being derived from it. So that seems a little bit harsh in terms of um, inductionism, and induction, of course, is still useful. So well, we could say that if the observation set is large and it is performed under a wide variety of conditions, these experiments, then of course uh, the uh, theories become stronger and stronger. And all this is really, uh, there's no such definition of when is large large and what are wide, really wide variety of conditions. Uh, that really depends on the situation. And so uh, here's a good example. For example, when I swim with sharks, I get bitten. You don't have to repeat that many times to understand that that's going to happen. So the question then is, with variety of conditions, and when do I know that observations are large? Well, that depends on some prior knowledge. And that is, again, the foundation of, um, of Bayes, is that in this uh, assessment of hypothesis under evidence, we'll have to, at some point, address our prior understanding. So in the history of science, uh, we arrived then now in the 20th century, where there was a clear reaction to um, inductionism. And there are a couple of other things like intuitionism that I'm not going to cover, uh, but I think uh, deduction or falsificationism is really an important uh, milestone in the philosophy of science. So one of the uh, main uh, supporters of that idea is Karl Popper uh, and said that science should not involve any deduction or theories derived from observations. And so in that case, they said, well, he said all theories are really very simplified approximations, just like we said before. And so they are only speculative or tentative, uh, and the idea of them is to overcome limitations of previous theories in order to progress. So that means that uh, theories need to be tested with observations rather than than say doing this whole matching models, matching data. Uh, we'd like to test theories with data. So in that sense, falsification means simply that theories that are inconsistent with observations should be rejected. And so this rejection is basically a falsification. So falsification, therefore, actually, unlike induction, has a sort of a time component. It describes progress that's being made, made in time. Well, inductionism is, is just uh, hoping by creating more evidence that at some point we'll arrive at the truth. So it was then argued, therefore, that falsificationism was much more of a reflection of how science works uh, rather than inductionism. So here's an example of deduction versus induction. Uh, in induction, premise is that all rock samples are sandstone, so the conclusion that sub, uh, con the subsurface system uh, contains only sandstone. So in falsificationism, we, we, we don't do it that way. We say, for example, a sample has been observed that is shale. That also means that our hypothesis that it only consists of sandstone is rejected. So therefore, the subsurface system does not just consist of sandstone. So the, the strength of the test here is, of course, uh, very important. Uh, so the more, uh, the stronger your test is, uh, the more stronger your falsification is. The problem with the uh, application of induction, induction by itself is, is just fine, but in the application of induction, uh, we often see what is called the ad hoc modeling hypothesis or ad hoc modeling. So I've come across that in many cases in applications, but I think probably the most stunning application was in the Gawar field in Saudi Arabia. So in the Gawar field in Saudi Arabia, which is the largest oil field in the world, um, we have essentially an oil field, all these dots here are wells, and some of these dots inject water uh, to drive the, the oil that's uh, sitting at the top of the reservoir uh, into these producers here. So these are injectors here at the side, these are producers. The problem with this rock is that this rock is a uh, permanent rock, and so it can be extremely permeable. Um, and what we often observed was that uh, water that was injected here uh, immediately reached uh, the producers uh, there much more faster than we can ever imagine uh, if we apply Darcy flow. So, of course, that gives observations of very fast, uh, what's called breakthrough, or first very fast arrival times. And so in order to build a model that matches this observation, if that is your purpose, um, then you can do many things. And so um, here are some really crazy things were done. Um, and so, for example, here we noticed that uh, this is the background permeability, which is already very high, this white. 
And so people started increasing permeabilities to radiculous ranges. And so um, induction would say, well, I matched the data, so therefore, you know, I've learned a lot, uh, so-called. Um, and uh, of course, you have not necessarily learned anything, and, and that will show in the next slide. Falsification would proceed, proceed very differently. I would uh, actually say, well, uh, if you observe these anomalous observations and you create a new model, which is basically a new hypothesis of what that would be, now you also need a new test. In other words, you need another observation uh, to test this particular hypothesis. But of course, in reality, this is never done because getting more tests is time consuming uh, and it's more work. And so people tend to avoid that and go with the quick solution, which is the model that matches the data. So let's now consider a little bit what Bayes says about all this. So you would imagine that uh, there is some kind of modeling uh, hypothesis that is prevailing in multi-phase flow uh, of some parse and permeable rock with heterogeneity. Uh, but you could say that this rock has some permeability that's you know reasonable, say it could not necessarily from 10, but some, some small number to some big number, but uh, typically 10,000 millidor C. So what's done in the previous exercise is that there was an ad hoc modification uh, being done uh, where essentially we said that now we have an addition to our hypothesis, which is uh, that we have to modify this initial hypothesis to add another, this other ridiculous range, which was from 100 to 200 Darcy's. What Bayes says about this is that if you would evaluate the conditional distribution of the ad hoc hypothesis uh, under the existing hypothesis, that that will be very small. So what that essentially says is that Bayes says that the probability of making that ad hoc uh, modification is very small. And you should, if you do that, you have to be very careful and assess this, uh, this probability. So this probability is actually never assessed. Uh, the probability of making the modification to match the observations under the null hypothesis, under the hypothesis is never made. And so people make, keep uh, on making small ad hoc modifications as they get more data. And so every time Bayes says that the probability of doing that or that probability of that actually being true uh, is very small. So you're multiplying constantly very small probabilities. It also means that the end result that you get uh, is a model that has extremely low probability despite, despite the fact that it matches the data. So you see here that this uh, prior is very important. And what was the problem in the Goar field is not so much uh, the fact that there is, uh, that this Darcy law is applying, is that we have fractures, uh, serious fracture systems uh, that were at that time, this is pre-2000, uh, essentially uh, were not acknowledged in the Goar field. And there was a time in Goar field where people say there are no fractures. Um, and so of course now nowadays uh, we have changed this uh, hypothesis into a much more different hypothesis rather than ad hoc modification. Uh, we say now that oil can flow in, um, in, in rock that consists, consists of porosity and permeability, but also in fractures, and that's a different kind of flow altogether. So a particular uh, point I really like about falsificationism is that it doesn't say that the models are true, true representation of actual reality. And I think when it comes down to earth and the kind of model parameterization that we use, uh, sort of the gridded blocks with uh, volumes of 50 meters by 50 meters by one meter, with all the heterogeneity that consists within within that particular area, uh, we could say that these models are highly simplified representations. And really, I think what they serve is as hypothesis from which we can calculate uh, observations and predictions, uh, and then start to understand what the relationship is between these variables. Variables, and this sort of um, uh, this prior distribution is going to then ver be very important. Uh, and what we will need to try to do is not to focus so much on, on accuracy. That means models that are matching very accurately data in a way that's it's actually nonsense because um, the models themselves are not really representation of reality. So doing that data calibration very accurately is a problem. It doesn't mean that we have to use data to reduce uncertainty on models, but uh, the model matching part, I, in my view, is a little bit oversold. So, Classical statistics, in fact, is a uh, very good example of falsificationism, in particular, the, or the early um, founders of, of, of classical statistics, Fisher, and and Pearson, uh, introduced what is called the hypothetical deductive reasoning. Uh, it's a reasoning that you're very familiar with and that you, you learn in your basic statistics classes where you're trying to do hypothesis testing. So again, hypothesis testing, as you see, is something that fits within some kind of uh, philosophy of science.
So no, the way hypothesis testing works is, is actually quite simplified. It's, uh, it's actually quite simple. Is we state, uh, we say uh, that uh, we have uh, two, uh, two coins. Here's an example. And we want to flip these coins. And we, uh, we believe, for example, that these coins are, uh, one coin is fair and the other coin is not fair. And so uh, we'd like to do that. And the way we do that is by falsifying some kind of null hypothesis, or at least attempting to do so. And so I know I positively say there's no difference between these coins. So then we go into experiments, which involve flipping coins. Uh, we can do this, run this experiment forever. So we need to stop it somewhere. Uh, and that will be the number of flips. And then we have to make some test statistic, uh, which is the number of heads we have. So for example, uh, if we have a thousand flips, then we expect uh, under the null hypothesis that the coins are not different, uh, that they will have an equal amount of heads. And so we, that, that amount or that difference in that amount uh, has a perfect as a statistical variation and we can calculate that under certain assumptions etc cetera, etc cetera. so the claim that was made by fisher and particularly pearson i would say uh was that this is very objective uh that there is no way to refute this way of, of reasoning and the point is essentially and it's still sort of uh, promoted by statisticians as being an objective way of reasoning but it turns out it's actually not really quite objective. And one of the, well, I would say that many, uh, so in, at this, at those time, people sort of rejected the whole Bayesian subjective probability point of view because they said, well, we can do everything objectively. We don't have to do this Bayesian thing. So that's not quite true. And I'd like you to think before going to the next slide of what, what really is subjective about all this. So here is somewhat of a, um, a summary some thinking around hypothetical deductive reasoning. So first of all, of course, um, this rejection or this uh, statistical argument uh, is only can be argued in the long run argument. So if you're rejecting hypothesis, for example, with a certain significance level, uh, then you can say, well, if I would do these kind of tests many, many, many times, of course, you're not doing it many, many times, you're just doing it one time. Then in the long run, uh, I'll find that it will be rejected with probability 0.05. So that means essentially that they're saying that a true hypothesis will be rejected by probability 0 0.05. So that makes no sense under objectivity, uh, essentially, that you can never uh, prove that events with probability P, they can never be proven to, to occur or not occur. Um, you can never measure this probability. And so that requires subjectivity in a basis that requires some prior understanding uh, about things uh, rather than saying uh, that we rely on objectivity. So this was later then uh, acknowledged by particularly Pearson, Pearson and later text uh, that reasons instead reasoning and statistics come with their own subjective notions because you have to choose the hypothesis itself, of course. Uh, you have to choose significant levels. You have to choose uh, stopping rules. And there's a, other, a whole bunch of assumptions that need to go into calculation of, of statistical variation. Uh, because you can do the repeat the uh, experiment. So you have to rely on assumptions, uh, modeling assumptions that say under these assumptions, for example, independence assumption, Gaussian assumptions, we can calculate the variability of the test statistic. And so that isn't necessarily, again, uh, requires a subjective choices. And that's not necessarily an argument against uh, this. It's just that we should not promote as an argument of pure objectivity, that even in, in this kind of hypothetical deductive reasoning, uh, there's quite a substantial amount of subjectivity. So there's, a, of course, also criticism of falsificationism. Um, the De Hemkin uh, thesis says that it's impossible to fa falsify scientific hypotheses in isolation uh, because observations uh, required for such falsification have to rely on additional assumptions, hypothesis, or uh, there's confounding factors. For example, in the subsurface, a good example for that is 40 seismic. So we'd say, well, the 40 seismic signal uh, could be a hypothesis of, say, a pressure uh, decline in the reservoir. But there may be other confounding factors. There may be other saturation change, or there may be gas coming out of solution. Uh, and so uh, to test a hypothesis that pr pressure is declining, uh, you have a whole bunch of confounding factors. So what this, this thesis says is that it's very difficult to, to design experiments that can only test one thing. Uh, and that essentially in your experiments, you have to also randomize over many other confounding factors. Uh, 
And then, of course, you run into the problem again as the previous case is that none of these tests uh, are equal, that there are always differences that exist between these tests. And so that's what we saw with hypothesis testing is you can't really test a hypothesis in isolation. You also have to make additional assumptions and additional hypotheses that you're not testing. And so uh, this thesis is, uh, that was made is, is quite powerful and very true, and unfortunately, uh, is that in many applications of science, we cannot test something in isolation. So moving along now in history, uh, came Thomas Kuhn and introduced the notion of paradigm. So a paradigm consists of certain theoretical assumptions, laws, methodologies that are being adapted by a scientific community. So for example, if you read journals of probability, probability theory and statistics, then uh, most of the people working in that realm accept the notions uh, of the axioms, axioms of and probably added to that some Bayesian axioms. So that paradigm within that community is not questioned. Uh, but then of course, uh, somebody finds out uh, some kind of an anomaly. And so uh, the anomaly may eventually to a crisis uh, and a revolution that may then introduce new paradigm. Uh, and that's what we already saw previously, that induction turned into deduction. Uh, and then there was the Duham Kin uh, thesis. Uh, and so there was crisis after crisis. Uh, so no one's really finding the answer uh, and paradigms are evolving. So in our context uh, and research context, as you're student doing research, we typically uh, follow the paradigm. You do these puzzle solving activities within the paradigm. For example, you may, um, say improve uh, methods of inverse modeling uh, by algorithms of Monte Carlo to Markov chain Monte Carlo with, that uses Gaussian prior distributions. Uh, so you're accepting a lot of the paradigm there that is that um, uh, you were in probability theory, you accept the Gaussian distribution, uh, you accept some form of um, conditional independence probably, et cetera, et cetera, in order to do that. But you're never questioning uh, and criticizing the paradigm itself. So one such paradigm uh, is Bayesianism. And so now we arrive to the important point of discussing Bayes, Bayesianism, and how it applies to decision-making under uncertainty. So let's talk a little bit about history and Thomas Bayes. Uh, so Thomas Bayes, as I mentioned before, did not write Bayes' rule. Uh, that came later by Price, who wrote a big uh, book uh, about uh, what Bayes had done. Uh, and there were four chapters in that book. And so in chapter three, uh, he talks about how Bayes was studying uh, this problem of a billiard table. And so in this billiard table here, which is represented by the square A, B, C, D, we have, uh, essentially, we have two balls. We have uh, the ball W, uh, and that ball W is thrown on the table and bounces around, and at some point that ball W uh, lies at this uh, location here. And so if we divide the table up from A to B, and we look at this line OS, which divides the table in two halves based on where the uh, ball landed, and we call this length here P. So this P, this length here is one minus P. So then we throw a second ball and the second ball is again bouncing around, bouncing around. And so it will land uh, eventually somewhere. And so somewhere it land either uh, in this mutually exclusive events is that it lands either here or it lands here, there. So the question now is what is the probability that the ball lands there? Well, that really depends on where the first ball uh, landed. And so that first ball, we have to make assumptions uh, concerning the table. So if the table would be perfectly flat, then you could say a uniform distribution for P uh, would be quite reasonable. But if the table is not flat, then perhaps uh, it has a dip. So maybe I can use a different uh, initial distribution. So the answer to, to that, uh, that P lies between P minus one and P two, given where the, where, uh, where the ball lands, is of course this uh, binomial distribution. And the DP here is essentially the uniform distribution. Uh, so if that distribution is not uniform, you would have here FP, DP, and so you would have something uh, quite different. So th the point is not to solve this problem. The point that, that that's important here is that Bayes reasoned about a prior distribution. There's something we already know a priori about the table before we're doing, or we assume a priori about the table before we're going to do this experiment. And so the assumptions being made is there, is there a principle of indifference is that we believe the table is flat, but that need not be uh, a hypothesis. We can actually falsify that hypothesis by doing many experiments and observe indeed that uh, the locations where balls uh, are falling indicate uh, a non-uniformity of the prior distribution. 
So what's the rationale for Bayes? So Bayes is essentially a method of, uh, or an idea of how we can learn from data. And particularly in stating a hypothesis, how do the probabilities of this hypothesis uh, evolve as we get more and more evidence? So Bayes does recognize that we are making predictions from imperfect theories. Uh, and so a joke could be that Bayesians take uh, their umbrella even when the model, uh, you know, because they know the weather models are not, are not correct. The theories in that are not correct. They're just approximations. Uh, so if the if the weather says it's going to rain, they will they will bring their umbrella because uh, they do believe have some belief in these models doing something reasonable. And so despite the fact that they've been falsified, I mean there have been uh, cases where the weather was completely wrong. So according to Popper. That would mean uh, that the weather models have fall been falsified. You should trust them. So, what Bayes essentially says, if you look at this rule, is that if you have evidence that's very likely, and you have uh, those evidence will not contribute much to very highly probable hypothesis. So if if you're if you're essentially your probability is already very probable, and your evidence is already very likely, then it's not going to change anything. What will change everything is when you have very unlikely evidence uh, that confirms very alternative hypothesis. So now you have two things that are happening is you have unlikely evidence, you have a very uh, un un low probability hypothesis. And so suddenly uh, there will be a big change in the probability of this alternative. And so that's always unexpected to people. People think more that uh, as hypothesis that as maybe if you get more evidence than, than sort of High likely hypothesis become even more likely. And so that's necessarily the case. So for example, let's say I'm, uh, I'm doing, uh, I have my own hypothesis uh, in um, here in rock physics that say that the acoustic uh, impedance uh, of a rock depends on mineral composition. That's a logical assumption that the minerals, of course, have different densities and structures and so uh, leads to possibly different uh, porosities and so uh, that leads to different impedance. And so um, that leads then to sandstone having a lower acoustic impedance than shale. So now, obviously, now suddenly, I somebody says, "Well, no, I think acoustic impedance depends not only mineralization but also uh, fluid content." So if I then observe a sandstone that has higher acoustic impedance than shale, that's so under the current hypothesis, very unlikely evidence. Then suddenly, the second hypothesis becomes much more. Uh, much more probable, and it has to do, of course, with the, the sandstone can be filled with some kind of uh, fluid that alters its impedance. So this learning from evidence um, it, it works really nicely uh, and can be done in sequences. Uh, for example, I can start with some hypothesis uh, that's 0 0.5, and I get some evidence. Uh, that says that the probability of the hypothesis given the evidence 0 0.8. So now I replace this prior distribution with this prior distribution. So imagine now I get a second evidence, which also says the probability hypothesis is 0 0.8. And so what happens then is now we have two evidences uh, that each of them indicate that it's higher than the prior. So if you combine them, you get actually a higher probability. And so that's something we saw in GS240, that if you use this kind of Bayesian way of reasoning, you'll find that uh, hypothesis uh, that each contribute uh, to, say, better understanding uh, of, of the uh, relative to the prior base rate, then eventually we'll get uh, increasingly higher probability. However, because uh, it never gets one in, the sense, in that sense, because I don't have any perfect evidence. The only time it will get one is when I get perfect evidence that reveals what the hypothesis uh, should be. So this base rate, uh, which we'll discuss uh, in the next uh, couple of slides, is really very important. For example, if my base rate is not 0 0.5, but 0 0.9, that means that I'm already quite certain about some hypothesis. And, and if I use the, the same kind of evidence as before, namely the evidence informs me about this uh, hypothesis, and now essentially uh, the, the, I'm, getting, uh, I'm going more towards 0 instead of going towards 1. You can see that. Um, as, as we go on here with these various uh, uh, data uh, evidences that are revealing something about the hypothesis, then you start um, decreasing this uh, very rapidly towards zero. Uh, and so that's the whole idea of this prior base rate. So we can't just say, I only need to know this. 
You also need to know this in order to solve this problem. There's a really nice book um, about how humans uh, behave in the context of Bayes. And I guess she goes back to two uh, scientists or economists uh, or psychologists, let's say, Chris King Kahneman, who actually got a um, Nobel Prize for prospect theory uh, in economy. There's a book written about them, uh, which is a very f a fun read uh, by Michael Lewis. It's called The Undoing Project. Uh, there are many uh, chapters there that talk about a lot of other things. Uh, I thought the ideas that were given there on how humans actually, and experiments they did on how humans uh, act in the face of evidence uh, was quite revealing. And most humans face uh, essentially ignore Bayes' rule. And the, ignore, the ignorance of uh, Bayes' rule, uh, just because they just rely on their own intuition, uh, has serious consequences in terms of, uh, of uncertainty quantification. A really cool uh, problem um, that was sort of a game show problem where base rule applies um, is the following. <clears throat> Suppose that, uh, that we have a doing, it's called a Monty Hall question after named after the, the game show, uh, show person that was involved here. Suppose uh, there's three doors and um, there's a car between a door. And so the player uh, is asked to pick a door. And then, of course, the probability a priori is one of our three, the cars behind that door. So then, say you're supposed to pick door one, and then the game show host goes uh, to the front and, and opens door two, and there's nothing behind it. So now the question is, uh, should we change door from door one to door three? And so the logical argument that's given is, uh, no, you should not change this. The probability is now one half instead of one three, so why should I change? This seems no difference. That's not the case. Why not? So we have to assess the probability of the evidence uh, with respect to the prior distribution. Remember when we talked about the Gouard field, uh, we also have to ass assess the probability of making ad hoc modifications. So here again, we have to assess the probability of evidence. And so to formulate this problem properly, we uh, state our hypothesis, of course, the hypothesis there is that the core uh, is the door car is behind a door? So I have here three hypotheses, and um, there are probabilities associated with the hypothesis. And then there is evidence provided. So the evidence is provided is here that a host is doing an action, right? Evidence is always an action, is a measurement, uh, and so here that would be the host uh, opens door I. So suppose you pick door one. So what happens then to door three or uh, to uh, door two? So Let's look at the uh, probability of, um, let's say we would like to uh, find out what is now the new, is it, the, the idea would be uh, here, and put my pointer on, uh, of course, is that you would think that probability under this evidence of hypothesis one is, is a half. And so to do that, Bayes' rule says, well, in order to do that, you have not only to, to look at the likelihood of the evidence, which is a half indeed, uh, but also the likelihood of the initial probability and the probability of the evidence. And so um, here we have this, uh, of course, um, if, if, uh, if the car is in door one, the probability of, of uh, the host ordering, uh, opening door two or three is, is, uh, is a half. Uh, there's no difference for the host. However, if, the, if you have that the car is between uh, door two, and so not door one, then the host has only one option, which is to open the door uh, three. Otherwise, uh, he or she would reveal um, where the car is. And the same, of course, for door uh, three. So this is very important, right? Is that these likelihoods are very important. Not only we get this, but also we get this here. And so if you then plug that into Bayes' rule, which then also require calculating this probability here, probability of the evidence three, which we can write by this, uh, sum of this total form of probability, um, then uh, we find that as a half times one third plus one times one third, and so that comes out to one half. So if you plug that in here, we get one half, one half, one third, and so we get now the answer, which is one third. And so you notice that you do need to switch doors, is that the probability of having door three, uh, having the car has now increased from one half to, from one third to two thirds. The mistake that is made is to ignore this probability of evidence and just say uh, that the probability of evidence is say a third. If you do that and relative to that, you find indeed that the answer is a half. And so 
um, you would not make that uh, assumption. As I mentioned, Fersky and Kahneman uh, did many experiments uh, with humans. In one experiment uh, that perhaps uh, speaks a lot to you as a student, is that students were asked to estimate grade point averages of hypothetical students. So they were given characteristics uh, such as um, comes from this college, uh, from this nationality, uh, other sort of characteristics. And so they were also given uh, statistics about the, the GPA distribution. So in other words, if you would have this student with these characteristics, what would be the distribution of, 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 of GPA, what the a prior distribution. And so what was interesting is that students then ignored this uh, and actually were given more weight to say descriptive information that was also provided. For example, they were provided information that wasn't really relevant to GPA. They could say, so well, the student was also really excelling in piano or the student was also a great at playing soccer. Uh, and so GPA scores went up uh, based on, uh, on this additional information that was provided without having any relevance. So they found actually that uh, interviewing a person uh, was, was, was not necessarily valuable because interviewers uh, were essentially unable to pick uh, successful candidates better than the basic statistics. In other words, if you had a formula that you had optimized based on these basic statistics, statistics you'd find that that formula did better than anybody doing any interview. And so why is that? And this is a, a very common thing uh, that we all do, and we have to be extremely mindful of this. Uh, it is a representativeness of what, I call, what they call the prototyping. So we're just looking for examples. And when we have a new person uh, on which we need to do an assessment, we always tend to, or a new reservoir, we're doing assessment or a groundwater system, we tend to think in terms of similarities. Oh, we've seen that somewhere before. And in that some particular case, uh, we saw that. Uh, it's not saying that this information is not useful, but you have to be very careful in just using that information, namely this idea of representativeness. And that's what they came up with, uh, Tversky and Kahneman, is that humans uh, use representativeness as a way of making judgment. And so why do they do that? Well, it's very easy to do. Uh, but the problem, of course, is that representation, something that's similar to a prototype, doesn't make it actually likely to occur. There's a difference between similarity, which is the likelihood, let's say. Uh, if this were a student, what is the evidence, what's the probability that it would have such and such uh, scores? But also we need to look at the basic rate, the base rates that are existing, how, which that tells us also how likely things are to occur. So given all this, uh, they concluded that people are overconfident in predicting this likelihood of uh, events. And the main reason was that they were neglecting base rates and were relying essentially on cognitive biases. There's also a lot of criticism, of course, about base is that um, base uh, stands or falls with the prior distribution. So any Bayesian analysis is as strong as the prior. And so, of course, that prior is extremely subjective. It depends on our experience our, and, uh, and the problem the, what we feel is relevant. And so, um, so therefore, um, What's going to be very important is that not only do we use an inductive argument in base, but also a deductive argument in base is that we'll have to test this prior distribution before we go ahead with it. And that will be called the falsification of the prior distribution. This prior distribution in, in the subsurface is extremely important because it's dominated by geological understanding of the system. And so this knowledge is vast, but it's often uh, qualitative. So the question then is, how do we turn all this knowledge into actually meaningful quantitative prior distributions? So the only way we're going to be able to discover all this uh, is again to do this in Monte Carlo. And so Bayesian dimensional learning, uh, the first stage would be to do Monte Carlo. The second stage would be uh, to assess uh, the model hypothesis under the evidence that has been provided using a Bayesian framework. So in that sense, Bayesian evidential learning relies on recognizing that the prior distribution, the base rate is the foundation of all uncertainty quantification and analysis. So if we don't accept that and we just look at evidence, then we run into this problem of representativeness in that we're basically basing uh, everything on similarity rather than on likelihood of occurrence. So we'll have to, uh, the prior must of course, uh, may not be able to predict the data. So that means the prior is falsified. And so uh, Falsify prior mean then can do things according to Bayes. What we should not be doing is ad hoc modifications. Uh, 
if the prior is falsified, then either the hypothesis is too simple uh, or the uncertainty on the hypothesis is too small. So we may need to create more hypothesis or we may need to change the probabilities on the hypothesis. What we should not be changing uh, is making just ad hoc modifications. So later on, Bayesian influence learning and then uh, we'll also uh, rely on sensitivity analysis, uh, which be discovered based now on this falsified prior relationship between model data and prediction. And that, that again, that relationship depends on this prior distribution. Uh, and then from that, we'll uh, learn to uh, create prediction strategies that again rely on Bayes rule, but now much more in a, in a technical. 